Hi, I'm Professor David Atlee, and this is Topics in Astronomy. Thank you for joining me. In this video, I'll be continuing with my discussion on the nebular hypothesis and planet formation by digging into the formation of Jovian planets specifically. Let's get started. In the previous video, we talked about the idea that Jovian, or gas giant planets, are separated from the rocky terrestrial planets in their position in the solar system. The reason for that is due to the location of what's called the ice line. Uh, the ice line is, has a bunch of names. Some places call it the frost line, some the snow line. It depends on the author and the publication. Uh, but in this video, I'll be calling it the ice line. So what is the ice line? It's a location within the protoplanetary disk where volatile compounds go from a gaseous to a solid state. So volatile just is a fancy word for anything that can exist either as a gas or as a solid or a liquid. So gasoline is a volatile, so is water. <clears throat> In our solar system, there are actually many ice lines for many different compounds like water, methane, ammonia, all of which are capable of freezing, but they are located approximately somewhere between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. Usually we think that they're a little closer to Jupiter than they are to Mars. Inside the ice line, so closer to the sun than the ice line, the only materials that are available to form clumps and planetesimals are rock and metal. And as a result, the planets that form inside the ice line are made of rock and metal, which is not really surprising. So we get terrestrial planets. We get rocky planets. Outside the ice line, so farther from the sun than the ice line, in addition to rock and metal, we also get, well, ice. And because the gaseous components in the protoplanetary disk are so much more numerous than rock and metal, we have a lot more resources available to build clumps and protoplanets, and we end up with bigger structures. One important reason that having a larger protoplanet becomes relevant is due to the gravity of that protoplanet. The gravity of a body influences its escape speed. So if you stand outside and you throw a baseball, eventually that baseball falls back to the ground, unless you're Superman. And if you throw the ball a little harder, it goes a little farther before falling back to the ground. And if you were Superman and you could throw the ball hard enough and fast enough, instead of falling to the ground, it would just constantly fall around the Earth in this path that we call an orbit. So there's some minimum speed that you need in order to quote-unquote escape from the Earth's gravity and reach orbit. And that's what we call the escape speed. Every planet and every massive body has its own escape speed that differs depending on the strength of gravity of that source. So stronger gravity means a greater escape speed. What could you change about a planet to increase the strength of its gravity and therefore increase its escape speed? Pause the video, think for a second, try and come up with an answer. It's okay, I'll wait. Okay, hopefully you figured out that to increase the strength of gravity of a planet, you could increase its mass. As you get a more and more massive, say, protoplanet, and you build up the gravity of that protoplanet, you allow it to more easily hold on to gases. Some gases have high speeds, so they escape. These are gases with low molecular weights or high temperatures. As you reduce temperatures, you start moving the gas molecules around more slowly, making it harder for them to escape and making it easier to retain the atmosphere that a planet is trying to build. Some protoplanets can get so massive that they reach a critical mass and their gravity becomes strong enough to allow them to hold on to not just heavy gases like carbon dioxide and nitrogen, 
but also hydrogen and helium. If you haven't already, you should try out the gas retention simulator from NAP linked at the end of this video. Those protoplanets that reach this critical mass and that begin to accumulate atmospheres of hydrogen and helium, they now have a truly enormous reservoir of matter that they can pull from as they continue to grow. So protoplanets that reach that critical mass threshold grow very rapidly into very, very large masses and very large sizes. They rapidly accumulate all of the available hydrogen and helium within the influence of their gravity. And at the end of this process, you end up with a core of rock and ice surrounded by a very thick, dense, massive envelope of gas, mostly hydrogen and helium. What kind of planet am I describing? Rocky and icy core with a big gaseous envelope? Well, of course, as I hope you figured out, that's a Jovian planet. So this is how we build Jovian planets. We grow Jovian planets beyond the ice line or beyond the frost line, and we build terrestrial planets within the ice line, so closer to the sun than the ice line is. We have these two different types of planets that form in different parts of the solar system, and that's why we have this separation between the rocky, Earth-like planets that are found close to the sun and the gaseous Jovian planets that are found far from the sun. And the break between these two categories is a location within the protoplanetary disk that we call the ice line. Thanks for watching, and I hope to talk to you again soon for another topic in astronomy.